Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos a todos. Espero me escuchen very bien. welcome. I hope uh, you're listening to me very well. 2021 Forum on Mining and Sustainability of the Americas. I am here with Carlos Sucre from IBD and Roberto Sarudiansky from CAMA. Welcome all. I am Marina Ruete, a Latin America coordinator for IGF. This is the third uh, mining sustainability of the Americas. Uh, we had the first one in 2018. Uh, CAMA in 18 was done in Lima. Uh, maybe you were there, some of you. In 2019, we were in Buenos Aires. We were there personally uh, due to the pandemic last year. We didn't do it, but this year we're going to go virtually and we hope uh, well, we'll meet you again in the forum, the fourth forum uh, in person. Thank you very much. Now the topic is uh, mining and sustainability forum. That's the cr critical mining in minerals. Uh, that's very important. Two events right now. The first one of the two events, we want to understand the mining chain of critical uh, minerals of the Americas. We are talking about Argentina and Chile to Canada as well. And the second of the events is uh, 10 of, of August. Uh, we're gonna be there because we're gonna talk about the proposal, the politics in regarding re realization of the um, critical minerals. These proposals are very important. This year is very important. And please, we're gonna give recommendations uh, for the mining as well. This year we wanna give more proposals regarding politics that are very well debated with all of you and maybe the Minister of Mining in the in the in the thing we're gonna to have together uh, that we have their approvals. Well uh, we are very happy to introduce uh, Mary Groville. He's a researcher in Latin America uh, from London School of Economics for the Caribbean. We have hired him to develop these uh, uh, political proposals that are very much related to the regions. This first presentation is regarding to the frame uh, to talk about the subject. Uh, thank you very much, Amit. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marina, for the for the introductions. Let me just share my screen. Well, um, yeah, I'm very pleased to 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 participate in this event today and to collaborate with the IGF. Uh, the bid and, and CAMA on this issue of critical minerals in the Americas, which is a very important uh, and relevant theme for the economic future of, of the region. My, my, my slides are in Spanish, uh, but I will be speaking in English with the live translation. So my main um, objective today is to frame the issue of critical minerals in the region and highlight their importance. Uh, in particular, I'll be addressing three questions before we open up to the panelists. Those three questions are, firstly, what are critical minerals, right? And why are they so important today? The second one is, what are the supply chains that are related to those minerals? And lastly, why regionalizing those supply chains is an important agenda in the context of uh, the Americas and especially in the context of the post uh, COVID-19 crisis. So what are critical minerals? These are minerals that broadly speaking, uh, there, there is no universal definition, but broadly speaking, these are minerals that are considered to be essential for the national or global economy, yet have no uh, viable substitutes and whose supply tend to be at risk of uh, disruption due to either geological scarcity, uh, geo geopolitical problems such as conflict, or other factors. Now, the identification of those minerals is highly uh, context dependent, uh, and, and their identification uh, varies across time and space. Across space, because a mineral that is considered to be critical for the economy of a country uh, might not be critical for the economy of another region. Uh, with our, in our initial uh, engagement with some of the, stakeholder in the uh, stakeholders in the region, 
it seemed that there's a, a difference between strategic mineral and, and critical. So uh, critical minerals are those considered uh, essential for the national economy, while strategic ones would be the ones that are not essential for the local economy, but essential uh, for other regions of the world. Uh, across time, because the importance of a mineral and, and the nature of its supply chain uh, can change and evolve across time uh, due to te technological innovations and disruptions. So uh, in a way, a mineral that, wa that was considered 20, uh, critical 25 years ago may not be considered critical today. And a mineral that is considered to be critical today might not be critical in 25 years. Uh, for example, uh, lithium, right? Today, lithium is considered to be a critical mineral because it's an essential input for electric batteries. But if um, you know, phosphate-based batteries become commercially viable, uh, lithium might not become as critical. Um, now, in context of today, right, uh, in the, the contemporary context of the Americas, the types of critical minerals that seem to be considered critical across uh, the region are minerals like copper, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, and mostly because those minerals are the ones that are necessary to fuel uh, clean energy transitions and to fight climate change more generally. Which leads me to the second point of my presentation, which is about the supply chains that rely on critical minerals as inputs. Critical minerals are used for a variety of strategic industries, right? Ranging from consumer electronics. So everyone has a certain amount of critical minerals in their smartphones or in their computers. Uh, but they're also used in uh, low carbon technologies such as solar panels, uh, wind energy turbines, and electric uh, cars. Um, and the emphasis today is really going to be about this, about the, the, the use of critical minerals for low carbon transitions. This is a graph from the IEA. I'm only going to mention it briefly because we have we luckily have a representative from the IEA who, who is going to expand on this today. But elect so critical minerals uh, tend to be used much more significantly in uh, low carbon technologies rather uh, as opposed to uh, conventional technologies. So electric car compared to conventional cars and uh, clean energies compared to fossil fuels, which means that there is a growing market for these minerals, right? And it's estimated that if we are really to meet uh, global climate goals, such as the Paris Agreement, the demand for critical minerals will rise dramatically over the next few decades. And the Americas happen to have very large deposits of those minerals, which means that there might be a very considerable opportunity for the Americas. Uh, so as I just mentioned, not only they have large deposits of those minerals, but uh, in the Americas, we also find the existence of downstream industries that use those minerals as inputs. Uh, and however, those minerals currently tend to be outsourced from outside the region with very weak uh, kind of regional trade and supply chains to, to, uh, to promote regional trade. Uh, in addition, regionalizing the supply chains that relate to critical minerals would present several benefits. The first one relates to the economies of scale. Most countries of the region, with the exception of a few, have domestic market sizes that are too small to achieve uh, economies of scale, either in the uh, supply of goods and services uh, in mining, but also in the downstream processing, which means that in order to achieve uh, productivity gains, it's essential to move from a national vision to a regional uh, vision of a, of a regional market. The second reason relates to the resilience to external shocks and uh, the problems that arise from depending on a single uh, supplying country. And this is one of the lessons that we can learn from the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, even though renewables fared better than other sectors in terms of supply chain disruptions, um, factory shut shutdowns in China, uh, shut, uh, travel restrictions and, and, and a wet season in Ecuador meant that low carbon technology supply chains were disrupted, right? And raised the awareness to the fact that if 
if we are serious regarding our uh, climate uh, commitments, uh, it also means strengthening supply chains and perhaps regionalizing them enables better resistance to external shocks. And the third point relates to the context of commodity dependence on, uh, and the vulnerability to, of, of trade to climate change. So South America in particular, far less than Central uh, America, the Caribbean or North America, is highly dependent on, on commodities, which exacerbates the region's vulnerability to climate change, right? Uh, several countries of the region are dependent on agro commodities, which where productivity is highly dependent on temperature and precipitation fluctuations, or on fossil fuels uh, that are at risk of becoming stranded assets, assets as the world uh, decarbonizes energy systems. So in that context, in order to build resilience to climate change, there is a need to diversify uh, those economies and thinking about how to industrialize using critical minerals as inputs provide uh, uh, a green industrialization pathway that would be uh, welcome given the current context. However, the development and, and, the, and the strengthening of regional supply chains would require uh, uh, adequate policy tools. Uh, it won't happen uh, by itself, and it will require um, regional cooperation mechanisms, which do not fully uh, exist yet. So in that sense, the topic or the theme of this year's Mining and Sustainability Forum uh, addresses the opportunities that can arise from using critical minerals as an as a engine of development in the Americas. Uh, we'll aim to provide a framework to regionalize um, uh, critical, mineral, uh, uh, critical minerals in the region, uh, but we'll also propose uh, practical uh, policy projects to promote regional cooperation in that sector and strengthen its related uh, supply chains. So on that note, that's all from me. Um, I also have the pleasure to introduce uh, Alejandra Wood, who is the executive director of CESCO, the Center for Copper and Mining Studies. And Alejandra will be uh, moderating this event. So Alejandra, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Amir, y gracias a well, thank you very much, Amir. Thank you, Ayajib, uh, Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, in the mining of the Americas. Thank you very much. I'm going to be moderating this conversation. It's very relevant for the region. If we want to uh, to fight then against the climate change, now I'm very help. I'm very very happy. Uh, well, to tell you and uh, give a warm welcome to the panelists. I'm going to tell them. Uh, well, they're very grateful and thank you, Marina for sharing uh, your screen to start. We are going to talk, we let people talk in the panel. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to switch your camera on. Sebastian Mendes is the director of the Transformation Technology uh, Mining uh, of Energy in Brazil. Uh, good morning in here. We have invited him to explain to explain us the minerals in Brazil and it, it and the link uh, of critical mining in the region. Please, uh, we have to talk about uh, let talk uh, Morgan Brasilia. He's the director of public policy in uh, the states. Good morning, Morgan. Uh, he's he was invited to talk about uh, subjects that are really relevant. Uh, a supply chain that's really relevant. And then Luc Leboeuf, in representation of Canada's government, International Division, Commerce as well, uh, uh, Natural Resources from Canada. He's going to tell us the experience, the Canadian experience regarding identification and extraction of minerals, critical minerals. And then uh, Casey Michaels, he's uh, a, a person that knows a lot about energy. He's here to talk about uh, global trends, uh, to talk about 
mean critical mining uh, international level. We're going to start with one question. Um, we're going to talk about IEA. Uh, okay, you see why is that relevant? Uh, why is that critical mining is really relevant? Thank you for that for that question and hello everybody. I'm glad to join this panel today. Um, the the short answer is over the past year we have seen more than 40 countries announce net zero pledges and in concept these countries represent 70 percent of global emissions and global gdp and if these countries really follow through on these pledges this will imply a massive increase in demand for critical minerals necessary for clean energy technologies i think this is really the the biggest growth and if you add to that the fact that many countries see these as, as minerals necessary for uh, other reasons national defense security and other parts of the economy there's set to see a massive expansion of minerals minerals production for lithium graphite cobalt many others over the next next uh, 30 years and there's a huge opportunity there but also huge risks and happy to have more discussion about that today Thank you, Casey. Very interesting answer. A question for Mr. Luc Leboeuf, a representative of Canadian government. Why is it so important, the minerals for Canada? And what are the key topics uh, regarding this uh, environment and topic? I will start with the key issues. Uh, I would note that these minerals and, and their supply chains are often characterized by a certain degree of risk, whether it be um, a scarcity of supply or high level of control by one or a few countries or, or technological challenges related to processing, refining and recycling of them. And um, as um, Amir noted in his presentation, um, the demand for the minerals will continue to rise to meet the needs of the many countries that have so far committed to achieving net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And, and Canada sees itself as being uniquely positioned to take advantage of this global context. Um, we already produce over 60 minerals and metals, and we are capable of producing many more. And we are the fourth largest holder of rare elements behind China, Brazil, and Vietnam. And also, we are the only one, um, the, one of the only nations in, in the Western Hemisphere with all the minerals and metals needed for advanced batteries. Um, but above all, I would say that um, the key advantage Canada has is its world renowned environmental, social, and governance credentials and clean mining practices. This is really our competitive advantage as consumers and product manufacturers are increasingly looking to develop new partnerships to secure responsibly produced minerals. And um, as we look forward, the real opportunity is not just about getting critical minerals out of the ground. It's also about doing it in a responsible and sustainable manner uh, because the countries that will be able to do so will have an advantage in also attracting the value added midstream and downstream manufacturing activities that require the critical minerals. And, and this is in essence why critical minerals are important to Canada because um, Canada is committed to achieving its net zero emissions target while also building a prosperous economy and critical minerals are essential to achieving this. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Now it's the chance for Sebastião Mendes. Sebastião, why are critical minerals important for Brazil? Good morning to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. The policies and directives in Brazil aim at producing each one of the metals and minerals with a focus in industrialization and promotion of local economy, as well as regional with sustainable employment and income. The critical minerals for the energetic transition, um, graphite, uh, strange earths, aluminum, lithium, copper, manganese, they represent a challenge and opportunities for the country due to the potentials in resources and perspectives of new discoveries. The usage of these minerals creates opportunities for an added value um, that Brazil wants to give 
to commodities, exporting um, higher price exports and developing certain achievements, certain goals. Key topics in the development of these supply chains are mainly geological knowledge, um, legal certainty and technologic innovation to bring innovation in research and the planting as well as processes, the planting of new mines and processes. It's important to create the possibility of generating an inner market. Thank you. Now we have the turn to Morgan Brasilia, representative of the United States Pain Institute. Adelante, Morgan. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and amongst uh, such an impressive uh, group and panel. Um, you know, I, I think there, there's a couple important things to say about the supply chains of these um, minerals and metals. And uh, the first thing to say is that we, we think that the energy systems of the future will be more mineral and metal intensive. Um, that's especially true if those systems move to zero carbon or low carbon as um, we think they will. If that's the case, then the mining sector as well as the supply chain all the way through advanced manufacturing plays a very different role than it has traditionally. That is, it, it plays a role of being the supporter of low carbon transition. So it's a very positive role. And that change in narrative is very important for the sector and the industry. Um, the minerals markets for most of these critical minerals are not at all transparent. And as a result, there are large governance issues related to those. I apologize for the noise. It's okay, sir. Go ahead. The minerals markets are not at all transparent, and that is a that is a problem for investors and across various countries, from those like Canada that want to be big exporters to those uh, that are going to be importers of these. Uh, related to that, um, and, and as a result of that. Uh, lack of transparency, there is a lack of price discovery and liquidity in these markets. And what that means is that it's very difficult for investors in mining and in processing plants and all the way through to advanced manufacturing to get the right price signals to make long-term investments. And that is where we could see some difficulties in the short and medium term between supply and demand. And the last thing I'll say on supply chains is just thinking uh, in terms of rocks or, or, or the, the sort of um, mining aspects uh, is limiting. You really have to uh, think about these complex supply chains. And why I say they're complex is that at least uh, in the United States, the list of critical minerals of roughly 35 different minerals, including but not limited to rare earths, um, each have their own supply chain. And some are not primary minerals, they are secondary or tertiary. And that makes the understanding of these supply chains even more difficult. So if we don't approach this um, in a rather sophisticated way, we are going to miss a lot of the subtleties that happen across these supply chains. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. No doubt, this is very interesting as uh, you input new topics. For the panel, let's invite Casey Michaels to answering 
this question, which uh, of the minerals will have an increase in demand and where do the, does this demand come from? Who benefits in this growing market and what can government do to prepare for this demand? I understand Casey is going to show a presentation or share a presentation. Yes, thank you. Perfectly and read. This is a great time to share a, some of the results from a report that the IEA released last May. Oops. Um, ahead. Uh, we conducted for this report a detailed assessment of different scenarios and technology pathways in order to estimate exactly this question, which, which, which minerals would see an increase in demand and how big would that be in the context of uh, a essentially a large scale deployment of clean energy technologies that would be consistent with the, a, a large effort to reach global climate goals. Now, in, in our context, as Amir already explained, many countries have different understandings of what minerals are critical. We focused on those that would be necessary for, to support that sort of large scale effort. In short, we found that such an effort will require at least a quadrupling of overall mineral requirements for clean energy technologies by 2040. That's the outcome in our sustainable development scenario, which is consistent with the Paris Agreement. Now, an even faster transition to hit near net zero globally by 2050 would require six times more mineral input in 2040 than, in, than today. The main factor behind this huge increase uh, in mineral demand is is our, our clean energy technologies. Now this includes lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and graphite, all of which are crucial to battery performance, longevity, and energy density. Rare earth elements going into permanent magnets that are vital for wind turbines and electric vehicle motors. Silicon, silver, and copper for solar panels, which although not very mineral intensive as such, will see enormous increases in total deployment. And finally, copper and aluminum for electricity related technologies as the infrastructure of cleaner and more electrified energy systems will require big and major expansion of electricity grids worldwide. Now, as mentioned, overall mineral demand may rise as much as six times, but when you start to look into the details, you see that for some minerals growth is much faster. Demand for lithium in particular sees very rapid growth depending on the precise strength through global climate policies and technology pathways, but in at least our scenario that um, demand for lithium is more than 40 times higher in 2040, followed by graphite, cobalt, and nickel at around 20 to 25 times higher. Interestingly, although this has not traditionally been the case, across many minerals, the energy sector becomes a major source of demand. Take lithium, for example. 10 years ago, demand for lithium for energy-related applications was minimal. Already today, EVs and battery storage have displaced consumer electronics as the largest consumer of lithium. And if we get on a trajectory consistent with the Paris Agreement, by 2040, 90% of lithium supply will go to the energy sector. Now, this upward trend for other minerals is similarly, similarly dramatic although it doesn't rise as high as for, for lithium. As you can see here, cobalt, the energy sector is responsible for more than 60% by 2040. Now on the supply side of the equation, uh, of course, each supply chain has its own specificities and complexities, but an essential point is that production of many energy transition metal, metals is highly concentrated. For lithium, cobalt, and rare earths, the world's top three producing nations control well over three quarters of global output. In some cases, a single country is responsible for half or more. So for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo accounts for 70% of global cobalt production today. When it comes to processing and refining op operations, the level of concentration is even more notable with China the decisive player in many of these areas. Now, many countries right now are considering how to position themselves with respect to this expected demand growth. And as of now, there's still a looming mismatch between current mineral supplies and the climate ambition that would drive the demand growth. If policymakers around the world not only make clear their long-term climate goals, but also begin to fill in the details for how they plan to get there, this may reduce investment risks and encourage capital in general to flow to new projects. And over time, we start, may start to see new players appear in this chart as supplies diversify. As countries further develop supplies, it will be important to acknowledge the potential positive role that mineral wealth can play in many countries around the world. 
As the market for energy transition metal grows, there's a naturally potential for the revenues generated to finance continued economic and social development. However, this comes with major countries, major risks for countries that rely on this wealth. As you can see, mineral exports represent an enormous share of the economy in many countries. And in six different countries in the Americas, minerals represent over 30% of exports. In these countries, it will be particularly important to ensure transparent management of rev mineral revenues to ensure that this mineral extraction revenue actually contributes to a durable economic growth that reaches beyond the mineral sector. Now, just my last slide, our report that we released in May outlines six key recommendations that draw on the IEA's longstanding leadership in energy security issues. And I'd like to highlight three of these points right now that may be particularly relevant to producers in the Americas. First, measures to support adequate investment in diversified sources of supply. So as I mentioned, early and clear signals from policymakers are critical to giving companies the confidence that they need to commit to new supply. But as we all, anyone familiar with energy security knows, security of supply also lies in diversity of supply. In this context, resource owning governments can support new project developments by reinforcing national geological surveys, streamlining permitting procedures to shorten lead times, providing financial support to de-risk projects, and raising public awareness about the contribution that such projects play in the transformation of the energy sector. The world also needs to step up efforts across the board to tackle environmental and social impacts of mineral developments. This includes the emissions associated with mining, local pollution, worker safety, and general public welfare. Solutions to climate change cannot work on the back of injustices or poor environmental performance further up the value chain. And suppliers have to do due diligence to ensure, to identify, assess, and mitigate these risks throughout the supply chain and governments in producer countries can play a key role here. Which brings me to the final point most relevant for the discussion today. There is a need to strengthen our international collaboration both between producers and consumers and among different regional producers and consumers. An overarching international framework for dialogue and policy coordination could play a vital role in, uh, in ensuring the security of supply, building resilience along supply chains and among improving environmental and social performance. Across all the areas listed here, there are huge opportunities for governments to work together. And as, as and many of these points are equally true on the global level as on the regional level. There are many positive initiatives that, have, that already exist across many of these areas, including ones like the IGF and others but there's obviously more work that needs to be done and there's still major gaps particularly associated with security of supply and ensuring market 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 transparency thank you thank you casey very interesting study i would like to make the second question i would like you to know how we could identify um, critical miners, minerals, uh, and to identify that with the country, uh, please. Canada's list of critical minerals was launched in March 2021, and um, our list is based on on many factors, including uh, the domestic, economic, and national security needs, uh, the needs of Canada's partners the expected global trends, particularly related to technology uh, for the green energy transition opportunities and security requirements, uh, while highlighting the potential to build valuable domestic manufacturing like batteries um, and their components as well. So from, uh, from September 2020 to January 2021, uh, my department, Natural Resources Canada, undertook extensive consultations um, on a draft list of 24 minerals uh, with our provinces and territories and uh, the exploration, mining and manufacturing industries uh, in, in, in the country. And uh, we also commissioned two independent studies to look at potential critical mineral supply chains from upstream all the way to downstream, a bit like uh, what Dr. Basilian was mentioning in his uh, in his remarks as well. So we're really looking at the at the value chains, the whole thing. A greater certainty and predictability to um, industry and investors by signaling the government's recognition of the importance of um, 
and allowing key points uh, in supply chains to be targeted and developed. And finally, it is also, uh, which is a, an act that allows us to review any transactions uh, involving foreign investors. And, and in this case, it's for um, uh, the signal is for a transaction involving critical minerals. Um, so our list is dynamic. I think on the slide, you can see uh, the little um, image here. Uh, each, um, each little stick has uh, the name of a mineral. So the 31 minerals are, are identified here in response to technological and mark our mineral resources potential further develops. And in terms of the policy aspects on critical minerals, I would just say that there is really a shared recognition in, in, in Canada at all levels of governments on the need to help advance critical mineral projects uh, to support the development of the critical mineral supply chains in North America, not just in Canada, and to strategically position uh, the country as a leading partner in that space for um, all um, the Americas, but also um, other partners around the world, uh, including the European Union, for instance, and and other countries in Asia. So uh, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, uh, Santiago is going to talk now. How can you relate the industrial sector of Brazil and the turbines of wind with the critical mining uh, minerals? Where do they come from? I'm talking about these minerals. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Alejandra. Well, Brazil has got this matrix uh, that are renewable uh, and very big in Brazil in this uh, research that is very much related. The electric in Brazil has generated in 2020, has got the different uh, participation, hydraulic 63.8%, uh, natural gas 8.6, eolic 9.2, uh, biomass 9%, nuclear 2.3, solar uh, 1.7. So 5.5% uh, 5. Uh, 5 was left. Uh, the ones that come from oil, uh, coal, and, and others. Something very important to say in 2019, in 2020, was the augmentation, the raise of 61% uh, of, uh, of energy that was that raised in the generation of 22% in the generation um, of electricity due to coal. Uh, the sources that uh, we got to critical mining is eolic and uh, solar hydroelectric energy. Uh, uh, electric energy and the other one do uh, make just a small contribution due to the minerals that is very well compared and goes low. Uh, critical mining in Brazil, uh, critical minerals in Brazil is divided into categories. The uh, uh, critical minerals for many, many countries in which the country has got many reserves in these minerals. In, also possibilities of expansion and of these resources through knowledge of all the thing, investments as well, research in uh, in mineral thing. Uh, this is the materials, aluminum, copper as well, mm, uh, graphite, lithium, and nickel uh, mainly. So uh, the, the sources of uh, these, these minerals are in the terri national territory. So uh, only lithium, uh, uh, the deposit is uh, restricted to uh, Minas Gerais. Uh, in the other region is the northeast of the country. Brazil has got uh, many, many reserves of reared uh, pearls. On, and we have uh, closed the production uh, cycle. The production is going to start uh, 2022, so that the country will contribute uh, to the diversification in this and the funding and also the elements of weird uh, pearls and, and stones. The second category is uh, uh, the minerals where we do not have many, many uh, things there. So, Minister, for instance, 
cobalt, zirconium, minerals that come from the platinum. Cobalt comes from Brazil as a subproduct of uh, nickel and copper. Um, we have to say that uh, due to the importance of these minerals, and they give a lot of money to the uh, con poor countries that are rich of, in resources. It's very uh, important to say that uh, uh, things are going to come. Transition of energy is going to impulse by the weather. Is not impulse in a very sustainable way, uh, in a very uh, responsible challenges and possibilities to get money from other countries, industrialization and get the money uh, that we can got from other countries that's critical is very much uh, a link to the uh, knowledge we have this group uh, it comes from the service of Brazil the cartography is very um, is very good uh, in and this is good for investment regarding mining and gives power to the private sector. Uh, juridic thing is also very important in the investments as well. In the sector, uh, we have um, now the legislation in the mining is focused in, in reaching the regulatory thing, incentivating as well the efficiency and competitivity uh, in the mining sector. The, the law in this uh, uh, regarding companies uh, that was done in 2020 establishes very important changes in the legislation as well has got a very positive results for the sector uh, creating then the politic uh, to uh, an integration as well the di different agencies uh, and other entities to ensure the integrity uh, that every, everything related to the company. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emir. Now, uh, Morgan's gonna talk. Um, uh, and who is, who is dealing with the critical minerals in the States and where do they come from? Thank you very much, Morgan. Of course, my pleasure um, and, and very interesting uh, presentations. Um, We've had, you know, the one, one thing to say that follows up on Luke's comments, especially, is that um, different countries and different regions have different ways to assess what is critical. So that, that term critical um, is analogous to what we used to use in energy or still use in energy as security, right? So it's an issue of security. And... Um, in critical minerals, we still suffer from using rather outdated and simplistic methodologies for understanding that security issue, whether it's a national security issue for a country or region or a, a geopolitical um, security region. So that's, that's one thing to say, and those methodologies are being improved, but rather slowly. Uh, you know, right now they're they're more similar to what we would have seen in, say, oil or uh, energy markets in in the 1980s, from a from an analytical perspective, and so that's on the methodology. And second, on the um, how different countries approach it. So Canada, sort of uh, closely to what uh, Australia does, thinks about criticality in terms of its own economic development, its own trade. Um, jobs and all the things that Luke talked about in terms of the country itself and, and taking those minerals and becoming a strong international player uh, in trade, which of course it is a trusted player, et cetera, great governance um, and all the rest. In the United States and in Europe and Japan, criticality is thought of almost in the reverse way. So in other words, where we, that's the United States say, or Japan or the member states of the European Union would get their, these critical minerals where they'd be sourced from and, and the, the relationship to source countries. So how much a percentage of the supply um, we would get from those places. So it's very supply oriented. And if you look at it that way, then you very quickly come to the same conclusion that some of the other speakers have said that China is the principal player, because as I 
as I always remind people in these conversations, the rock or the minerals are not the most valuable part of this chain. The, you first need the, the processing and the chemicals and then you need the advanced manufacturing. But if you look across that value chain, across that supply chain, China still emerges and even more so as the dominant player across most of these critical minerals. Of course, not all of them. Um, so that becomes then an issue for how countries have relationships with China individually or through the WTO. In the United States, uh, as you all know, that relationship, uh, well, is not terrific right now, right? There, there's a number of different uh, geopolitical uh, issues between the United States and China. This is one of them. It's certainly not the only one. And it may not be the most important one either. Um, so those are a few points on how we think of those, those critical minerals and where they come from. Now you've mentioned or for this audience, um, let's we and we've talked a lot about lithium, and I, you know I think we've covered aspects of the lithium uh, triangle from Argentina and Chile and and Bolivia, but you know one thing to say there is that these markets are global, and while um, and, and so trade and and uh, relations or international relations become very um, important as do prices. And so once the markets build up and you have more transparency in those markets, then you really see that um, Bolivia, despite its terrific um, resources and aspirations, is going to have to compete with a, a, a player that has those relationships, is already producing, and uh, is producing at a high level, that, that is Chile. And then uh, with a country that understands resources from oil and gas, which is Argentina. And so um, those three countries don't become some kind of pact. They actually end up competing with each other unless there's, unless there's a um, concentrated effort to do otherwise. And in that competition, at least currently, uh, Chile is way out in front on the lithium, of course. And, and a lot of the other mining uh, aspects. And Bolivia has issues around some of, some of the governance structures, but it also has issues around the technical uh, aspects of the mining, the resource itself. And Argentina has, well, you know, people's memories are short, but they're not that short. And they remember the nationalization of oil, despite what, what is now ha happening in the Vaca Muerta. But, uh, you know, the, those memories still exist. And so, you know, you, you, you've you asked me to comment a little bit about this, uh, the lithium triangle. So th those are a few thoughts there. D despite what I've just said there, um, this still is a global market. And so uh, the, the, those bilateral agreements as well as multilateral agreements are going to shape it. And uh, those include geopolitical considerations but are not limited to them. So. Uh, let me stop there with a few comments, hopefully Alejandra, roughly in the area you wanted to hear. Sí, muchas gracias, Morgan. Sin duda, muy Thank you very much, Morgan. It was very, very important, very interesting. Uh, we're talking about this angle. Uh, it was very critical mineral and the differences in the... Um, critical issue due to the source, the security, and the difference, uh, Canada versus the States or Japan or the European Union is, uh, it's very, very important for, co for the copper producers. We see that thing very well. I want to, uh, well now, well, this conversation is very interesting. Now I want to go forward with a third round of questions. It's the same questions for all the panelists as well. Uh, and it's the following one. What do you think, what do you think we need to regionalize the highways uh, for the critical mining, critical minerals in the Americas? I want to start, uh, I will let uh, Casey Michael speak 
to keep the order of the conversation uh, in a very proper way. Thank you, Casey. Thank you um, for this question. And uh, there's a bunch of different aspects on uh, of this that I think there's effort there, but maybe I'll focus on one of the key ones. And that is that, in, in my view, the, the biggest obstacle to expanded development of these minerals, certainly in the short to media ter medium term, is the absence of the market signals that we would expect to see in a really full, like, you know, quickly decarbonizing world. And right now we do have all of these pledges, but we have yet to see really very many countries put the meat on them and really say what they're gonna look like. And so far there's still a big lack of the investment that would be needed to meet that. So, I mean, the biggest thing that countries can do on a regional level, global level, or even at a national level is to send clearer signals about what they expect their energy market to do over the next 30 years. And not just saying with pledges, but also with saying how we're gonna do it and what we're gonna get there. And in the absence of that, or in parallel to that, there's a big potential for countries and either, either in groups or on their own to build parallel ways to build those market signals whether it's uh, by you know, national support to various industries. We're seeing some of this in the US where there's government kind of push to develop specific mineral production. Um, and there's many different ways that governments can work together to do that. But in the absence of the kind of global signals that we would need, then governments can find other ways to you know, really send those signals to pro producers within their country, whether that's by providing um, improvements and or kind of support subsidies, these kinds of things. I, I, there's many different ways to do that, of course, um, but that seems to be one of the critical obstacles to really providing that opportunity for countries, producing countries in the Americas to take a role there. Muchas gracias, Casey. Eh, me gustaría si Thank you very much, Casey. Same question for Luke to regionalize now the critical mining. I guess to answer, I will, I will point out a few examples that, that we're having in Canada. So in Canada, we're already having discussions to further integrate supply chains in, in a regional manner approach, um, including with our neighbor, the US, uh, but also with the European Union. So uh, in, in the European Union's case, um, what we're doing, and I've seen comments and questions in the, in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll speak to that a bit. Um, we're we're nice. leveraging the free trade agreement that we have uh, with the EU to actually have those discussions on, on supply chains. And um, we just agreed to a strategic partnership um, to explore how we can address together some of the market challenges that have been mentioned by other panelists in terms of uh, the issues related to critical minerals and, and the whole supply chains. And um, so, uh, you know, we're also having currently having agreements uh, with most of the countries in the Americas, including free trade agreements and foreign investment promotion and protection agreements. And we're also in negotiations to sign free trade agreements with Pacific Alliance and, and the Mercosur trading bloc. So those are potential tools that could be leveraged to have those type of discussions. And um, we actually see great potential for further supply chains as integration in the region, um, not only because um, you know, we have a, a lot of mineral wealth and, and there's a lot of manufacturing uh, opportunities, I think, in, 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 in the Americas, but also because all the countries in the Americas really have a lot of, uh, of the critical mineral needs, uh, critical minerals resources that are needed to power the clean energy transition. Um, actually, I really believe that the Americas have the potential to um, better leverage their vast minerals and metal sector to drive this global clean energy transition and actually attract more manufacturing outside of Asia. And um, um, like I briefly mentioned earlier, I think that However, it's how we're going to go about meeting this demand and more specifically, how we're going to be integrating best practices and driving innovative, responsible and sustainable mining across our operations and partnerships in this hemisphere that will really dictate our success. Um, and to achieve that regional success, I think one, one thing that every country can, can do to contribute is really to examine their strengths and weaknesses in terms of their value added to these supply chains and, and try to address them with uh, policies and incentives that are um, that could be uh, implemented. 
And that includes sometimes things like uh, critical infrastructure for efficient transportation, manufacturing capacity, uh, incentive for, for refining capacity as well. Um, and um, I just need to conclude, I think that conversations like the one we're having today are actually, you know, important to start trying to create this regional vision and, and having more of a common understanding of what is needed and the roles that each and different countries can play to integrate mineral supply chains. That's one thing that other regional blocks I, I find have a better handle on. The EU has a clear vision that is common and, 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 and sort of agreed upon. Um, same thing with Asia Pacific and, and, and the Americas. I, I find that that's one thing that always lacks. Um, there's not much of a common vision across, um, across the whole region. We have some sort of agreements in, in the North and there's discussions in the South, but I find that there's not such a good um, uh, discussion ongoing at, at the whole Americas level to really come out as a regional block. And, and, and that's one thing that I think is, is lacking right now and that we should be addressing. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Very interesting answer, uh, full of challenges and opportunities. Uh, let me uh, invite Luis Santiago, Emir Santiago, Sebastian. What is it we need to regionalize a supply chain of uh, critical mineral minerals in the Americas? Thank you, Zandra. It's a very important challenge with lots of challenges, the regionalization is a critical, a key topic. International agreements tend to so strengthen international um, commerce and uh, the development of supply chains and critical minerals in Latin America, the complementarity of mineral resources and the uh, productive capabilities among countries can increase the value in the supply chain. The integration among countries based on investments in infrastructure energy, uh, renewable energies, and technologies make them more competitive within the global markets. For that, it's critical to have a better knowledge of the potential of mineral resources within the region. Another important factor, which is relevant in a possible collaboration uh, between nations in the supply chains is establishing governance of critical minerals within the region. Thank you. And now it's the turn to Mr. Morgan with the same question. I'll repeat it. What do you think it's critical to regionalize the supply chain of critical minerals within the Americas? You know, so, so I spoke about one um, mineral, lithium, and the challenges between uh, three of the countries in the region. But in general, I think that um, the most important thing in the short term or the short to medium term is to make better markets, more transparent markets. So there's, there's a couple of things to think about there. One is that we're not just talking about markets for rocks. For, for, for minerals, that is. We're talking about markets for chemicals. So those are the processing that takes place after the, after the mining. And chemical markets are different than commodity markets uh, in very important ways. So that's one point. The, the second point is that the transparency and the liquidity of these markets um, and the governance of them has a huge impact on whether the industry will get the right signals, as I said. So that means if you do not have good price discovery in a market, then you have a very difficult time understanding when to invest and how much to invest and at what scale, especially if it's over a de decadal or a 10 year, 10 year period. Now the mining takes that long or can take that long. The processing and the other stages across the supply chain take less time, but at the mining stage, you really need those uh, price discovery signals. And for the Americas, like every other region, 
if you don't have liquid markets that have good governance and the price discovery, that you are going to be guessing all of the time. And it makes it very difficult to, to start an industry at any point. And the last thing, so that's the second point. The last thing I'll say is, and I noticed that this in Bolivia's uh, aspirations for lithium, are that the president has talked about a strategy for uh, a, a full supply chain, right? All the way through advanced manufacturing, let's say to batteries. Um, that can be a very good idea. In other words, in the right place, if you have a full supply chain, you actually incentivize things that are great, like recycling. And in other words, you only see recycling in markets that have that full supply chain all the way to advanced manufacturing, primarily in Asia. Um, but uh, it's not. It's a. It's a lot easier said than done to create an entire industrial ecosystem where it doesn't exist now. And so um, it is a good aspiration, uh, but it's very difficult. But I think um, the focus on that transparency of the markets, the liquidity of the markets, the governance of the markets, and then the aspirations for understanding supply chains, whether it will be through industrial development in your own country, or whether there'll be arrangements with other countries for that industrial development um, are three sort of key issues for the Americas, but frankly, there are key issues um, for everywhere. Thank you, Morgan. Let me tell you that we have gotten to the end of this stage of conversation in the panel of questions and answers. And I would like to now give the floor to the answering of most of the questions we have received on behalf of the chat in these topics. I would like to invite Emir Marce back to the forum since they have, uh, he has different questions posed to him, I mean, and uh, on the cameras, because the first question, I'm gonna make it, and it's for you, Enner. Tell me, Enner, if there are regional studies, mostly in Latin America, that might allow to assess the potential of critical resource minerals within the region we have seen here only what countries like Canada, uh, Brazil, or the United States. Nevertheless, there are other countries with lots of high reserves in minerals. And it would be interesting for the audience to understand if it has been studied. Very good question and, and several, uh, so several questions related to this. Uh, there has been a few efforts to begin to map out critical minerals. Uh, across the region in various countries, and there is appetite for this for this information, but it's still mostly missing uh, at the regional level and in, in several countries. Uh, and this is a problem because in order to guide uh, smart policies, you need to have the information on what you actually have, right, and the cards that you are dealing with. Um, so it's critical to produce more data, right? And the proper mapping on, on critical mineral reserves and deposits across the region. One of the issues was also mentioned by some of the panelists in terms of methodology, right? What are critical minerals? Uh, how do different countries define them? How can you define them at the regional uh, level? Uh, and this is why uh, we're holding the, the, this forum uh, to raise awareness uh, on, the, on the critical need to map out the, and, and gather this information. Uh, and the need to get a regional approach, right? Because your neighbor might consider this as critical minerals. So hopefully more and more work will be done and more studies will be commissioned uh, in this area. Thank you, Samir. Amir. Now I would like to pose this question to Lou. I would like to also invite the other panel members to compliment his answer. In your opinion, Luke, what is it that organizations on behalf of the private sector are doing to educate the basis uh, around these, this topic? It looks evident 
that in these kinds of discussions or forums, we understand what we're talking about. Nevertheless, when we talk about communications to public opinion and the press and professional levels in general, they are related with the uh, development of natural resources and, and local governments, there is not necessarily a knowledge that this is a strategic topic. In the next three decades, I direct a study center and we're preaching most of the time regarding the crossroads we are having and the great opportunity in a world we are discussing most of the conditions to carry out mining within Chile, which could be good. And what could happen wrong? We could lose a strategic opportunity as a country if we did not take advantage of it. How could we extend this conversation, which is important for the development of our countries to the public opinion and the rest of the forums? Luke, please. Uh, merci. Uh, sorry, uh, just I was listening to the translation. Uh, so uh, if I if I understand properly, um, I'll, I'll try and answer. So I think the awareness of, of, of the importance of critical minerals as as increasing uh, increased so much over the past two years. It's 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 incredible. Um, you know, I see it through my work. Um, I've been working in 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 the mining sphere for for the past fifteen years, and and um, we used to um, often, you know, being uh, overshadowed by discussions related to energy or oil and gas, and and these were seen as the more strategic commodities. And, and over the past two three years, um, it seems like really critical minerals have, have really gained importance. And as, as you see now, an agency like the International Energy Agency does reports on critical minerals, which is now never seen before. The World Bank has released reports as well. I think um, you know leaders around the world have been discussing this now at the G7 uh, meetings. The past one, uh, it was an important topic. So, so this is something that is is really becoming more and more top of mind for 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 countries and and, and people around the world and and um, I think it's just going to continue um, gaining importance as well as as we move along. So um, I think the work is, to answer the question, we see the work is already on, underway and and um, there's uh, I think um, obviously some some education to be made more with local communities and 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 with um, and, and more at the local level, but but I think in general, um, you know, things are, are, are progress. I see that things are progressing in the right way, and and that uh, this this topic is just becoming more top of mind. So that that would be my answer to this. I wonder if any other of the panel members would like to add anything to Luke's answer. Okay, let's keep on then. This question is both for Emmer as for Casey Piking. Uh, which are the implications of the ever-growing demand for critical minerals in an um, area like the Amazon? How could we prevent the culture of degradation and deforestation of this land in the exploitation of these uh, critical mineral exploitation? Not only in these critical area, but in other uh, places. Emmer, please. Well, I think that there is not much that much risk uh, regarding that in the regulatory framework of mining in Brazil is very transparent, see through, and strong. Uh, the environmental regulations are are one of the best in the current times. There is a fiscalization, good support and accompaniment, and the participation on behalf of the society. Society is very attentive, mainly in the Amazon region. Experience of mining within this country uh, poses or aims at something the contrary. Mining has a very punctual acting performance and with the 
presentation of the activity of mining, one of the biggest reserves of forests in the country is the Amazon region, the Carajas region, which has been preserved by the mining societies like Jitchu. It has an interference, which is very punctual. Nevertheless, with the conditions of preserving the whole environment better, much better than in, in any other industrial activity. And society, Brazilian society is attentive and there is a good accompaniment. And due to, and, and legislation is very good, actually. Thank you, Emmer. And never, uh, no doubts, illegal mining is an issue in most of our countries uh, of Latin American region. Casey, what is your answer to this question? Um, thank you for raising this question. I, and I appreciate that. Gracias por hacer esta pregunta. Me encantó que alguien la hubiera hecho. Desde mi punto de vista, hay riesgos serios a el ambiente global, local y regional en cualquier contexto de minería. Cuando pensamos en la posibilidad de los desechos y, y las posibilidades de desastres grandes eh, en minería, los colapsos, la polución, la contaminación de ruido de cualquier tipo, claro que impacta la biodiversidad y eh, en cualquier lugar, eh, en cualquier sociedad cercana. Esto es cierto en cualquier lugar, pero en el Amazonas es muchísimo más crítico. Lo que quería eh, mencionar es que hay ejemplos que vemos en todo el mundo acerca de eh, lugares en donde se ha hecho bien y eh, donde se ha aplicado bien la ley, se ha pensado bien eh, los marcos regulatorios y ha habido acción voluntaria por parte de las compañías y los países enfocándose en un enfoque holístico de proyectos. Antes de cualquier cosa se requiere hacer un eh, análisis eh, a escala global del de tema. Y hay mucho trabajo hecho por organizaciones como por ejemplo la de Canadá. Uh, standards such as the IRMA standard. And there's still a lot of work there to be done. And I wouldn't say I'm right right now that we're where we need to be in very, you know, hardly any country in the world. There's obviously a lot more work that needs to be done. But at the same time, if we recognize that exploiting minerals is critical to avoiding the worst consequences of climate change, then going back to your previous question, how to, this is part of the message that is going to the public, that this is something that we need to be prepared to do um, for clean energy transitions. And at the same time, we need to find ways and we need to work together. Vamos a necesitar maneras para poder asegurar en maneras que esto no afecte a todo el mundo. Muchas gracias, Casey. La verdad es que de otro modo también eh, va a ser muy complejo obtener la licencia. In some other ways, it's going to be very difficult to get the license. Uh, it's a very, very big challenge. Uh, we have uh, sent to the Morgan because in some other countries it's like Ecuador and Colombia that have the territories that are not very well explored regarding my mining, but uh, we have great technology coming up. They can overcome difficulties to integrate the value chain in segments uh, like uh, critical minerals in the States, for example. What's the role of the commerce um, and in this commerce? What's the role of this of these countries uh, with the States, with, with America? In, in How do you want to answer that? Thank you. Um, th thanks, Alejandra. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the question exactly, but the, 
la puedo hacer de nuevo, lo que pasa es que la estaba traduciendo yo en mi cabeza y ahora uh, que... I'm going to translate that again. I have that clear in my head. I'm thinking countries like Colombia, Ecuador, that have a lot of uh, uh, reserves there and that we don't know developing those, they should be thinking uh, how to add value to the value chain, uh, giving priority uh, to this mining, critical mining and do business with other states. And what's the role with America uh, uh, with this development that's taking place. Do you think America has got a role to develop that? So uh, the, the United States is, of course, a huge demand center for these critical minerals, and um, but not the minerals themselves, right? We, we, we do very little of the processing of them. So um, we are sorry i'm not speaking on behalf of the united states but the united states is um obviously a, a large demand center for advanced manufacturing parts whether it's uh silicon chips or um uh, electric vehicle batteries etc um and of course the united states uh is part of industrial policy is thinking very carefully about what what it wants to develop itself and over the last many years, um, in fact, through the last administration and this administration, oddly, um, there is a focus on, um, you know, uh, build and buy American, right? That there, there, there is a, a focus on, it's not quite nationalism, it was under the last administration, now it's more open, of course, but it's still, there's still a buy American um, focus and jobs in America. So, um, you, you know, so, so from that perspective, um, you know, it's, it's not clear what the prioritization would be to buy from specific regions, you know, that, that's a matter of diplomacy and international relations and those things get uh, muddied by this sovereign focus. Um, on the other hand, the, the US State Department, which is of course a, 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 an outward looking organization, um, established its uh, ERGI initiative, ERGI initiative, Energy Resource Governance Initiative under the Trump administration. And it's one of the few initiatives that continues under the Biden administration, um, mostly because it was a good idea. And, 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 and what it was, was um, looking at the uh, relationships between the United States and specific countries and partners, as well as the wider governance framing for, for critical minerals. Um, and so that initiative has some, I think, usefulness for these other states across, as you say, Central America and the Americas, um, more than most of the other initiatives, uh, say from the Department of Energy or the, the other very internal focused um, parts of the United States government. Um, and, you know, frankly speaking, the focus for the US government on international relations on critical materials is not the Americas, the focus is China. And so, um, just to be blunt about it. And, and, and so, um, but that's not the case with the ERGI initiative. The ERGI, the, the initiative I mentioned from the Department of State is much wider than that and looks at building much more healthy markets through good governance. And so I think there are some clues there um, for those countries. But as I said, again, you have to look at the supply chain. Is the United States importing lots of raw minerals to process? The answer is no. Um, and so, as, as you clearly know, Alejandra and the other speakers know as well, and the audience. And so, um, you know, we, we, we have to look where on the supply chain it makes sense to think about that trade. Um, and then besides the ERGI initiative, of course, the, a lot of this will play out in the, the WTO and whether or not the, there could be some kind of multilateral agreements on these aspects is not is not yet clear, or if there will just be fights, uh, you know, bilateral kind of fights in public at the WTO uh, is likely, is more likely in my opinion. Thank you very much, Morgan. 
Mm. Well, I'm going to talk uh, to Luke right now. You mentioned that Canada, uh, Canada was very, very much doing in sustainable mining, uh, low in emissions. Is there a possibility uh, for uh, parallel methods to extract the metal, like set a minery, uh, for example, to uh, uh, to get those minerals uh, to scale, so that uh, this can play a role. And in the same way, if Canada is available to share this experience uh, with the rest of the regions to promote uh, the sustainability in this. Uh, uh, supply chain. What do you think? Thank you. So, so if I understand the question, so, you, so, um, asking me whether Canada is um, open to share good practices with the rest of the um, the region, or? Yeah. Well, regarding the the innovations regarding uh, the benefits uh, regarding the minery, city minery as well. In Canada, we, we have um, a very advanced and developed uh, sector of, um, we call them mining supply and service companies that develop these very innovative um, approaches and solutions to, um, to various challenges related to mining. and and. They're not necessarily mining companies. They're just uh, companies that that help develop an, an innovative products to 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 to, to challenges and and uh, it, it's a sector that is growing a lot uh, that we are trying to to help um, uh, export uh, their their knowledge and, and technologies to um, other mining markets around uh, the world and and in, in it, obviously for for Canada's mining industry we are a global mining leader and and we have um, significant mining assets or companies or significant mining assets around the world but especially throughout the Americas um, so so those type of solutions are are, are solutions that um, that we are trying to make sure as a government to to, to help promote uh, the export of their technologies and, and knowledge to um, to mining operations all over the the Americas and and um, yeah that, that's what I would say on this one. Muchas gracias, Luke. Eh, esta pregunta es para Emil. Thank you very much, Emil. This question: Brazil uh, imports uh, critical uh, minerals from other countries in the region. Do we have opportunities to uh, increment the the, the 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 trade with the, neighbor, the neighbors to extract um, the everything regarding critical uh, minerals? For example, um, uh, the turbines, for example, producing the helices to produce energy. I didn't. We have uh, in, uh, commercial opportunities with the neighbors. Does Brazil import uh, criti uh, critical minerals if uh, to produce energy? through wind is this possible to have uh, uh, international trade with neighbors uh, yeah we have great opportunities uh, we import copper we, we produce copper in well in the region in the north of the country for example we import uh, uh, for the south or uh, east part of Brazil of Brazil. There are other Im imports, for example, we have this example of lithium, for example, Brazil's got lithium, but um, in, in, a, in a different manner, so that countries like Bra uh, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, they have lithium in Solaris. Uh, they ha that's, this is where they have uh, lithium. In Hearthstone lithium, we have. So all the processes of the mining are different, but uh, the the chain, uh, the industrial chain is the same, basically. Um, there is space uh, to cooperate. Uh, there, there's an interest to cooperate. There's great opportunity to 
to get a nice relation among countries uh, that are neighbors uh, regarding the mining industry. And if Brazil, uh, if Brazil is looking for a transition uh, for cleaner energies, um, a photovoltaic energy is a great opportunity to supply uh, among countries uh, I'm talking about neighbor countries to develop technologies uh, that are very important. Well, in the electric sector, we've been talking and in the mining uh, industry, we have to go forward. Thank you very much. Uh, there are many questions. Uh, uh, well, Morgan has pointed that out in many of these answers. What can we do to accept the producers and consumers? It seems that we have uh, forgetting uh, the, the, the countries. There's uh, there's a copper case, the refining, uh, semi-refining, and it's just right there uh, that we have the final product that is going to be manufactured uh, uh, we need some other connections, some dots in this conversation, uh, so that we have to keep in mind that this processing of minerals uh, is not necessarily there in our region. That's a challenge. It's a strategic conversation we have now. I have a question for you, Nigel. Uh, I'm going to translate that in the best way. This question uh, disappeared. Sorry, Casey, I'm going to change the question. How uh, is that a, you can make the whole thing attractive for a nation like uh, in which the, the citizens disagree with the mining uh, to, to explore uh, and extract the minerals? Uh, taking into account that China has got the market, I'm um, talking about the minerals with prices that uh, very good prices. Uh, regard in facing that is very difficult to compete. In other words, uh, the, the question is the uh, mineral production with the processing and refining and the charge of the treatment. And uh, China has got great capacity and how are we going to compete unless the business is very good uh, regarding an economic point of view, I'm not talking widely, but it's uh, just a word issue. Um, yeah, this is also a very important question. The first it's part on how to promote critical mineral extraction uh, in a context where societies oppose mining. I mean, this should be a cost benefit analysis done at the national level. Uh, I mean, maybe we don't all share the same opinion, but there are some cases in which mining should not be promoted, especially if there are very high opportunity costs, right? And that should be assessed on a case by case uh, basis. Uh, an example I have in mind is lithium in Bolivia, where I think the debate is real. Uh, the, the lithium is there, but the, the water uh, that, that would require to, uh, the use of water required for the extraction would prevent uh, quinoa production, uh, but also thinking about the uh, loss of tourism revenues, right? If the, if the, if the salaries are, are destroyed. So then it's a real question of, is it, is it, does it have a negative worth or a positive one? And in some cases, it's clearly can have a positive worth and can help fuel the clean energy transition. Uh, so I think it should be a, a comprehensive dialogue with local populations in terms of, is that resource really worth it? Does it have local socioeconomic benefits or are we actually going to destroy biodiversity, right, in the name of low carbon technologies, which then makes no sense. But that discussion needs to happen, and often it, it's not. The question about how to develop capabilities, especially in contexts where there are little pre-existing capabilities in the face of intense competition from, uh, from some uh, countries, that links to the role of capacity development program, right? Most of, no nation is, is you know, has a, is a, born for no one is born for being a low carbon engineer it's it's a lot of capabilities that are policy induced as well in terms of education training uh, r d support and that actually links to uh, another question that was asked about wto or international trade uh, agreements that's something morgan mentioned as well in terms of 
the possibilities for integration of supply chains between Latin America and, and, and the US. Uh, yes, those international trade treaties pose challenges, um, especially not just the international ones, but uh, sub-regional treaties, right, like NAFTA, Mercosur, but also the FTAs and uh, bilateral trade in, uh, investment treaties that country might have signed. But those, and I mean, challenges in terms of the policies that can be used, but those challenges are not avoidable, right? With smart policy tools, you can avoid some of those restrictions. Uh, so for example, you might not be able to impose local content requirements, but you know, promote capacity development programs, reorient education programs towards the skills you need for critical minerals extraction, R&D supports, and the obvious one that we don't talk enough about is information sharing amongst neighbors and amongst the region. Uh, that information that is needed to match the demand and the supply of goods and services that neighbors might have, but there's very little coordination, which means that trade opportunities uh, are lost. Thank you very much, Amir. Now, uh, KC, please. Uh, the things were put on the table that are very much linked with the things we have been speaking about. It's a question um, uh, regarding uh, from the Minister of Mining. We have not yet reached the moment to regulate, prioritize uh, the use of um, uh, strategic uh, minerals to avoid overexploitation. exploitation uh, regarding that. Mm. Yeah, this question has been raised. Uh, Case, uh, please go go on with the with the question, please, and answer. Thank you. Um, I'm not entirely sure I recognize the question, but I did have a, a quick comment just to follow up on a point that Amir made, if I if I may. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this this issue of how countries can compete. Um, and like, especially when we're talking about processing and refining, we have this, this kind of paradox where in countries like, like, like the United States, Canada, and uh, just particularly in the OECD countries, where we have consumers um, kind of demanding that we, won't, we don't want that kind of industry, that kind of very, very polluting, difficult, environmentally harmful industry like refining and, uh, and also mining as well in our country. Um, for these reasons. And then at the same time, we are not demanding that the, that the products that we consume in, in our homes meet those same standards. And essentially, it's just this paradox of if we're not going to, we have these sets of standards that we must live up to, live up to in our country, but we're not going to hold the products we consume. It really is the, the heart of the problem of why countries like well, why we see this this difficult this kind of supply issue with China so prominent in refining and uh, and in this this part of the value chain because these are very um, potentially very high polluting industries they're very difficult for workers and worker safety conditions and right now there is still a gap where the consuming countries across the world not just in the U.S. and 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 the EU but across the world can demand more downstream or upstream. And there's a lot of efforts here from the OECD in terms of these various due diligence processes where essentially companies can be forced to uh, look upstream and find these risks. And this can have a potential to raise the environmental standards, raise the social standards across the board. Um, because if you want to access these big markets, then you really have to move your production towards these, these level of standards. And I mention this because this is also part of the answer for why the regionalization, why the Americas can all, the countries can all work together. Because if these sets of standards are demanded across the board, then the potential competitive advantage that a country like China, or in the context of cobalt, a country like DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, a big part of their competitive, not the only part, but a part of their competitive advantage is that they're not being expected to live up to the same standards, legal standards and regulatory standards that would be required in other countries. And obviously, there may be competitive advantages that have nothing to do with that. And this is part of that cost benefit analysis that Amir was referring to. But at the very least, we can't let this kind of race to the bottom be the reason that we have this lack of supply diversity. And this can allow countries in the Americas to compete elsewhere 
if everybody's held to the same standard, then it becomes a very different picture. Gracias, eh, Casey. La pregunta era del ministro de Minas de Colombia eh, y eh, es, es en torno a si tú crees que llegó, llegó el momento de regular, restringir o priorizar a nivel mundial el uso de algunos minerales estratégicos para evitar su sobreexplotación. I'm, I apologize. I didn't hear the translation, for the interpretation for the. Oh, I, I'll just put it. Colombian uh, mining um, minister is to regulate, restrict, or prioritize at a global level the use of uh, strategic minerals to avoid the uh, over exploitation of them. Yes. Thank you. I think the answer to that is yes, there, there's really a gap at the, the global level um, in, in recognition of this fact and recognition that this is going to be necessary for the global clean energy transitions for every country. And we don't really have that, that recognition. And once we recognize that, then the very next question becomes, how do we ensure security of supply that's needed for those transitions? And that includes all of these issues, uh, making sure that we're not over exploiting in particular locations that we're not exploiting the local populations by accident along the way and really there's a huge gap um, there's no organization that really has the mandate out there to really be considering these questions in a holistic way uh, at least not yet i mean there are many organizations that look at very specific aspects of that and are very successful including the the, the world bank and igf and others but there needs to be more attention. And as Luke pointed out earlier, that we are starting to see this growing momentum in the past couple of years. And it may be that we'll see more effort from this either at regional level or global level. Obviously we are starting to see this in the EU, but, but we need to see it beyond that. Muchas gracias, Casey. Comparto 100% tu respuesta. Thank you. I share completely your answer. This question is for Morgan. Just to, just to clarify the audience, what, in what way do chemical markets, are chemical markets different from the mineral ones and how affected or integrated are these two markets integrated? They're referring to the difference between maybe extraction and exploitation of minerals. Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. It doesn't have a very simple answer. There's no, so let's keep in mind what we're talking about here is the, the way this discussion is typically framed is about a critical mineral. Sometimes people conflate critical minerals with rare earth minerals, which are 17 other things that are a subset of most lists of critical minerals, but the lists of critical minerals are regional or national, right? There's no there's no objective list of what's critical and what isn't. And then the discussion usually comes down to, depending on the audience, if it's an energy audience, then the, the discussion mostly focuses on those minerals needed for battery components, right? So th therefore we talk about lithium and nickel and manganese and graphite, et cetera. But so we, we tend to talk about very different pieces of the puzzle, depending on the audience and the perspective. Um, in today's discussion, we've been talking about energy minerals, primarily battery minerals, and then once in a while, a mention of a rare earth. So a couple of things to keep in mind. One, energy is not the only demand center for these minerals. Um, energy is a very important one. And when we talk about zero carbon and low carbon, then it's a, a, even more important. But as an example, in the United States, a lot of demand for um, some of the rare earths and some of the other critical minerals comes from the defense sector. And if you look at the critical minerals list of the United States um, or Europe or Japan, you will see advanced manufacturing, not necessarily only for energy, uh, but for defense and for things related to defense, which tend to be, say, uh, IT related. Okay. So I've created a sort of annoying answer to your question, which is to say that it's very difficult to answer 
a question about say 30 things or 10 things or 15 things that have utterly different markets and scales. So the, the first thing to say is um, some of those, and I'm gonna use the United States, uh, some of those 35 minerals uh, are tiny markets, absolutely tiny, like the, the, the amount of a couple truckloads. So they are nowhere near um, what you would consider a, a, a real global liquid transparent market like oil, right? Not, not even remotely close. And so you can't treat them or answer that question in the same way. Do two truckloads of things do not have the same complexity and they were almost always going to be run by either monopolies or oligopolies across the supply chain until they get into advanced manufacturing goods. So that's one thing to say. Um, the trade of the minerals, of course, goes to processing plants. And when they're processed for chemicals, they go into entirely different market types and different markets that are not specifically the same as commodities markets as we understand them. So they are not um, traded on the same markets uh, or in the same way. Um, they, and they have other issues like uh, uh, temporal issues, like can they sustain, can they just be traded forever without actually going to be to delivery, right? And that's not the case in a lot of them. You actually have to move them to market or keep them in certain pressure and temperature constraints for a long time, which costs a lot of money. So, you know, the question is a good one. It's impossible to answer in a generality, which of course is not the nicest way to do things in a conference because you want a neat packaged answer. Um, but I can't do that. And so what you really have to look at is like even look at the lithium we're talking about. Is it is it hydroxide or is it something else? And where is it going in the advanced manufacturing? Uh, some of them have different constraints, as I said, on shipping and temporality and safety, et cetera, just at the chemical process, let alone where the market for the batteries is going. Is it, is it going to go, will the market of the future demand this type of chemical or this type of chemical and the plants and the minerals to ship them. And then the last thing I'll say is, and I said this in passing was, some of these minerals are secondary or tertiary, right? Including, Casey has brought up DRC cobalt several times, including cobalt. Um, and so how you decide to look for copper or nickel, or if you're going to prioritize cobalt will all influence the answer to that question about everything from the market itself to the price, to the governance, to the impacts on local people. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of us, have, sorry, some of us have come to this issue from an energy background. Certainly the International Energy Agency has, and, and a lot of independent experts have as well. And while some of our analogies hold up, um, some of them don't, of course. And so you have to be careful on which analogies we use that are useful across those two sectors. Um, but I apologize uh, for, for not actually answering your question. No, no tiene por qué pedir disculpas porque es una pregunta muy, muy compleja. Muy... This doesn't have to be a good answer since it's a very complex and wide question. Thank you, sir. Now, the other two questions, just to comply with the schedule, we're finishing up soon. Uh, last two questions. First question for Emir. Given the lack of, of refineries for uh, components of batteries in the region of ALC, how do you consider the possibility uh, in Sao Paulo uh, for the processing of materials uh, like nickel, lithium, and cobalt, and how can it be a reservoir and a provider for South America? Thank you for the question. Yes, it's a center with good possibilities of having this kind of structure, but I think more of 
uh, for cobalt and nickel, there is already an initiative in that sense. For lithium, I think the best structure will have to be possibly the state of Minas Gerais, uh, the value of Chignonia, uh, where uh, the biggest reserves of lithium within the country are uh, located. And there are certain projects now and, and productions in smaller scale, but there are projects of uh, production and the possibilities of uh, having a factory of batteries then uh, pro uh, approximately in the city of Fora close by. So for lithium, the best place would be Minas Gerais. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And last question is for Casey. If the technology in low dimension are evolving in such a fast way, how could we make it possible for countries which try to implement uh, or and play a role and move within the value, uh, the supply chains without running the risk of becoming obsolete due to these changes in technology? This is a really an, an interesting question, um, and it, it brings up some discussions about, I mean, there's many different aspects of technology, both the technology of the mining production, but also the technology of the end use. So, I mean, thinking about battery chemistries, uh, they're not all interchangeable, and there are different scenarios where we see pretty big differences in, for example, how much cobalt is needed, how much nickel is needed, how much manganese, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that the key is the technology is moving quickly. Um, and the biggest risk is these long lead times for mining production. And uh, this is, you know, the initial formation of the, the mine can take 10 years, 15 years, uh, very long time. And this is really the same kind of a, an aspect of the larger problem. And it's part of the reason we haven't started to see the the investments in these in this, these minerals, um, at least not on the scale that we've expected. And frankly, the, the best thing we can do is um, look at these projections and expect countries to hold themselves to their, you know, long-term goals. And obviously companies will be able to make decisions about the various risks. Uh, we, we trust them to make this kind of decision for other markets as well. But I think the, thing, the key thing that's missing is the overall direction and not necessarily, we, we can't expect the countries of the world to say we're going to need X amount of cobalt, but at the same time, we wouldn't expect them to say that we need X amount of various other materials and carbon fiber and other things that need to be produced as well. So it's a major challenge and I think it's one that we should expect country, companies and their consulting firms and all the people involved in this industry to, to, you know, to, to work on over the next few years. Thank you, Casey. We have finished with this, this part of the event of today. I thank so much to you all. Your opinions are so interesting. This topic is fascinating. It provides challenges and opportunities for all local governments, for international cooperation, for academics, uh, for the private sector and mainly for the territories there where uh, mining activity happens as well as for global trade. My participation gets here, gets up to here. Please remember joining the second session, Critical Minerals in Americas to Strengthen uh, Supply Chains, which will happen in some more days. I would like to give the floor to Saturiaski of Kama to close up the event. Thank you, and we'll see each other in the next opportunity. Thank you, Alexandra. Congratulations uh, for the moderation. It was unbelievable. You have taken all the panel members and all the audience to a very interesting 
road regarding this topic, we had to analyze to all the panel members, your inputs have been very valuable, taking into account all the objectives we're setting forth for the next conference, the next meeting of the Ministry of Mining of the Americas, which I hope will be on the 2nd of September, uh, carried out by the SEER. Besides, we have to thank a lot to each one of the people posing the questions on behalf of the audience and who mm, gave their own opinions. These opinions are the elements which are very valuable for the task we have to face now, which aims at formulating proposals, solutions, questions for this second encounter of the uh, next 10th of August, where we will try out these proposals to strengthen the supply chains in critical minerals within our region. Thanks to everyone. I really thank the coordinating committee of Kenna all the entities which helped us out in distributing through the technical secretary all this information. Thank you. And we will see each other on the next 10th of August. May all be blessed and have a nice day.